This is a production of Cornell University. So, so I, I got a special treat that you can call bonus content, right? Bonus content uh, for the show. If you want to uh, edit this out, you, you feel free to do so. But since we've got uh, Brother Rich here, I, I, we have to start out with his insight uh, on, on this momentous occasion about to take place at, at Cornell University. Uh, for those of you watching on News Channel 10, uh, I'm showing the logo from the 1977 concert with the Grateful Dead that was held here that is considered by aficionados to be among their most finest performances. And Rich, you talked about um, how them practicing with little feet uh, in advance of this for a while uh, got them good and tight something they weren't usually, but I guess most people in attendance didn't notice the difference. So was there just a lot of, <laughs> lot, lot of fewer stone people here uh, at Cornell or, or they were really good? Uh, I, well, the dead was really good. And, and there's an argument among deadheads whether Cornell was the best show ever or not, but it was certainly through a period, 1977 might be one of the best years. You know, it depends on your taste as, as in dead music, but that they were tight and they had a good repertoire and they they were uh, as good as they can get, put it that way. And and like, you know, it might not just be the Cornell show, all of spring 77, even up into uh, uh, a show from from here, English Town in September. Um, uh, they they were great. And and uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, you can listen to the shows. The record store day is this week. And they're putting out uh, May 5th, 77 from Buffalo. And, okay. And that's a great show too. So. Okay. All right. So listen, Carl, I'm just going to take it from here. Uh, welcome to the Cornell Turf Show. Uh, I'm Frank Rossi with my colleague, Carl Scamenti, and our good friend, Rich Buckley, the director of diagnostic services down there at Rutgers University. And I'll just start it out for those of you watching, not listening, a wonderful uh, evening picture from Johnny Paquette. Uh, down at Indian Hills on Long Island, just a beautiful property that Johnny takes a lot of pride in and love when superintendents have good pictures. And Carl, you know, a good BMP in the morning is a, is a check your irrigation system. And, oh, this head's sticking on there. And this superintendent said, well, you know, wonder why it's sticking on. And you look close, you can see there's a big old rock in there uh, blocking the rotor, preventing it from spinning. So, you know, a reminder to get out there and check those heads. Don't just turn them on, assuming they're working. Get out there because we're going to talk more about that. Now, just, to, you know, what we used to do back in the COVID days is remind everybody, uh, you know, as we get going, there's other people who rely on us many times and, and also good to take some time and go see a live show every once in a while, right, Rich? Maybe 175 of them in, in a good year, right? <laughs> At least every two weeks, it's necessary. All right, good. So, okay. Now, looking at the weather, Carl, here's what I can tell you. It's been warmer than normal. You know, you didn't need a PhD to find that out. It was 20 degrees above normal in the metro New York area and more so than that up in the Rochester area. You know, you get out into western New York, even in the Adirondacks, you're talking in about 20 degrees above normal. Now, for those of you that use the forecast website, you might not have noticed this, but we've got this timeline above all of our maps now that maybe you haven't seen it. Sometimes we have it there for pests a lot. Uh, here is, you know, what it was like. You can see last week it was 11, 14, and 14 degrees up above normal here in the Ithaca area, right? And it's telling me that the next bunch of days you can tell are going to get a little bit cooler or a little bit closer to normal, right? As, as we look at temperature departure moving forward. So uh, most are about 10 to 21 days ahead of normal when you look at growing degree days, the uh, accumulated heat uh, over the last from March 15th, when we try to say this is when it's happening. Now, there might have been some accumulation at the end of February this past year, but for right now, everybody, the, the data is saying the season is ahead of normal. Now, there's other things that are signs of that. The peak annual bluegrass seed head flush is now probably prominent in the metropolitan New York area and south. So, you're going to find out pretty quick how your seed head program worked this year as the seed heads start to come on and any stress, particularly drought, will enhance and amplify the seed head 
uh, bursts that you get as typical in with annual bluegrass. So most have been dry. So we're setting up a little on the dry side here, quarter inch, except Rich, did you get a bunch of rain last week? It looks like some of these areas got three to four inches. You didn't get that. Did you? I, I didn't, I didn't see three or four inches. I, I mean, it rained, but not, not like that. So yeah, that is some heavy rain in, in Northern and uh, Central Western New, New Jersey. Now, in the last month, right, you look at the cumulative effect to about where a little bit before, short of where we are now, there's a dry gradient in the west and the northwest from Buffalo, Rochester, the northern part of New York, really on the wet side, 150 to 200 percent of normal. And then as you get to the southeast, down towards Long Island, the Delmarva, down where you are, Rich, it's been dry for the last month. Now, things may be picking up. ET is certainly uh, picking up, but the drought monitor, and this is the one from last week, we're waiting for the new one for this week, it comes out on Thursday before all of this comes together, but we're starting to get measurable dry weather in the Delmarva, into Philly, Harrisburg, PA, Southern Jersey, Hudson Valley, Orange County, across Southeastern Connecticut, all the way over to Rhode Island. So, you know, we're starting to set up to be pretty dry and it you know, it's sort of not getting a signal one way or the other how much rain we're going to get. We got a forecast from Art this morning indicating maybe about an inch, an inch and a half of rain potentially passing through. Almost all of it expected on Sunday this week. Dry soils means warmer soils. And as we start our conversation with Rich today, we'll start with thinking, okay, first off, one of our early signals for pathogen control and the kinds of pathogens that we want to talk about today, Rich, are, are these soil temperatures building, right? As the soil temperature builds, the microbial activity in the soil begins to increase, and some of those microbes like to feed uh, on plant roots. Now, here's some data from your colleague at NC State, Lee Butler. Lee puts out on his website every year his samples uh, stuff when he gets them, right? And he looked at his 14-year average compared to 2022. And his data indicates on his bent POA submissions, and he gets them from all over the country like you do, in his bent POA submissions last year, his peak was lower and later than last year. And I brought this up because in our casual conversation, I think this has been pretty consistent with what your season was like last year. You had fewer samples uh, and they were later. Now, the conversation that I'm going to pass it to Carl to talk about is the summer patch and the root pathogen conversation uh, moving forward. But how about this, Rich? Would this characterize your diagnostic sample submissions? They were lower and were, was the peak later last year? It, it, well, it, for us, we were definitely lower. I was uh, uh, down about 30% um, from, from the year before. And we were in a range that was close to the to the level from 30 years ago. I mean, that's how <laughs> that's how few we had. And ours, we had a weird pattern um, where it was wet early in, and so we peaked early, and then we trailed off as it dried out in in our area in the Northeast. And and I, I always think that uh, you know it's easier to add water when it's droughty than it is to take it away when it's wet. And, and we were kind of wet May, June, and then we dried out and it, and it that's how it was reflected in the sample submission. Perfect, okay. So as we, Carl, venture in, and I pass it to you, brother, this is a picture that Todd Lowe, uh, he used to be with the USGA in Florida, now he's with Enview, or uh, I'm gonna get in trouble. I don't, one of the companies down there, uh, he's still working in Florida. This was a Bermuda grass tea that these sections were phrase mode for sprigs to plant somewhere else. And the large patch, which I think is a soil borne pathogen, is it rich? Large patch? Uh, yeah, it's a rhizoctonia. It's, it, you know, same as our brown patch. You okay, know, just, but it's you know, coming out of the soil, but it's a foliar patch. It, yeah, I mean, it, it survives well in the soil and uh, it makes sclerotia, and, but the disease is a foliar disease. Yeah, so only in the foliage that got phrase mode did they see it. It's a really uh, fascinating 
uh, phenomenon and teaches us how little we know about this. So Carl, let me let you put talk about this wonderful little rant you put together. It's really going to set up Rich for a lively conversation on root pathogens today. Go ahead, Carl. Yeah, so, so this is something I've heard you guys talk about for a while, Frank, these root pathogens and, and maybe being more of a concern up here uh, as, as the climate is sort of changing. And I've heard you guys talk about this idea of, you know, so war of attrition. And when we think about roots, right, we've got to sort of build this mass of roots early in the year, because whether it's root pathogens, whether it's uh, heat or drought, you know, nematodes or something, they're going to get uh, eaten away over the course of the summer, right? So this idea that you have to build a solid root system early on, and that's going to help you get through some of these patch pathogens, even if you're, you're good or not so good at controlling them with the drenches and stuff like that. So I decided to take a look, okay, when is sort of the ideal root growth when it comes to soil temperatures? Uh, you can get some stuff from James Beard here in 2001. He's got a cool little three-pager turf grass root basics. And he says that the optimum root growth temperatures for, for our cool season grasses are right around 50 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Frank, you just showed soil temperatures in the region, the southern parts of our region are getting right into their low 50s now, mid 50s. So we're creeping into that ideal time to build the roots, right? To build for that war of attrition. Uh, once we get to 80 degrees-ish soil temperatures, that's when, uh, you know, James Beard says, hey, critical root loss. That's when we're gonna start to lose from sort of abiotic stresses. Then you look at the disease cycle and say, okay, when are the diseases coming on? Well, they start to, to infect at 19, 20 degrees Celsius, that's mid to upper 60s, right after our optimal root growth. And they peak, fungal growth peaks at 28 degrees, see that's low 80s. So right as the, the root growth is slowing, the pathogens are coming on. So, so James Beard had this little uh, slide here, he sort of drew a little line of, of ideal root growth activity. And then I drew a red line, uh, that's sort of the summer patch pathogen. That's when it's coming on and you see for those watching, that's peaking right when root growth is waning, right? So this idea of war of attrition, we got to build those roots early on right now. What can we do to do that? Uh, you can do, you could do it with nitrogen. You got to find that sort of a nice balance of not too much, not too little. You can do it with perfite. But I think from a lot of superintendents I've talked to who build good root systems, it starts with irrigation, right? And we talk with Rick Slattery a lot. He helped us build this panel in our uh, sustainable golf handbook that we just released, right? QR codes on the screen there. A little stress goes a long way. And we have these little icons up here that indicate, hey, do this in the shoulders of the season, right? When that root growth is optimal, right? Whether it's in the spring or the fall, intentionally allowing some moisture stress, right? Let's see where that wilting point is early in the year because, hey, it's the springtime. It's not gonna get away from you quick, right? Even if we get these you plus 10, plus 12 degree days, Frank, it takes a long time to get to that maximum temperature during the day. We don't have all that day length. We've got cooler nighttime temps to sort of buffer that. So explore where that wilting point is early in the year, let it dry down. That's gonna help push your roots deep, right? So we make this sort of analogy to athletes where uh, you gotta got stress the, the turf a little bit to, to build that resiliency, to build that, that root system. And we talk about deep and infrequent irrigation, right? So deeper cycles, wetting the soil down six inches, a little bit past where the roots are, maybe even eight inches. There's data on this from Peter Noden, uh, Jim and Food did this down in Maryland. Right, and for those who can see, there's uh, deep and infrequent uh, uh, irrigation, how, how many uh, basically root surface area there is compared to light and frequent. And in all of these root zone depths, there's more roots uh, in the deep and infrequent approach. So that's what I think of, what I've heard from superintendents who build those solid root systems, get them through the year, right? That's where it starts to, to sort of uh, give you some leeway for, for these root pathogens. Stress in the turf a little bit, let it dry down, and then those deep and infrequent cycles are going to help you build those roots right now uh, to get you yeah. through the summer. This is brilliant, Carl. A absolutely brilliant. To, to, to this particular chart here, where you're looking at this thing. So, Rich, let's start here. This is great. Um, is this when you start to get samples, right? Because we've talked about this in the past. Um, does a little stress in the summer? Help or hurt? Uh, a little stress in, in the, the summer. spring. Sorry, in the spring. Does a little stress in the spring stress or or does it help or hurt? Uh, I think it, it, you're going it, to, it's clear it's going to help you a little bit, right? Um, you know, pre prepping for the summer. Um, you know, it, it, that's if you have good plants and you have good roots. You know, I was, I was looking at a sample yesterday and I'm like, this is summer patch but I shouldn't see any dead grass here, 
but the root system was already so troubling that I don't think this this particular superintendent's going to have grass by the time it gets to midsummer. Whoa. You, you know, and and so so uh, I, I don't know how you recover if you're already in trouble now, right? So so uh, yeah. so so again, I think if you have healthy grass and you can stress it, and and you know clearly from the data, that's a good thing. But if you don't, you're in trouble. So yeah, Frank, that's a good question too. There's stress. There's uh, mowing stress. We're not saying, hey, go and mow and mow at a hundred and roll every day. We're saying stress it from the irrigation perspective. And Rick and, and Rich was just saying, hey, last year when the spring was wet, when we had all that moisture in the system, when it's tough to take it out, hey, that's when we start to see samples. But if you get a dry spring, it's interesting. You know, maybe we get fewer samples in because we're sort of uh, building that deep root system through uh, basically drought stress, through moisture stress, not through the uh, hammering it, getting it down to height, low heights and, and rolling, right? So there's a distinction there. I think uh, that's important. I agree 100%. And I, and I think to, to, to me, it, it begs the question that, you know, you're going to get feeding uh, on these roots. Does more roots help or hurt, right? The theory is have them more. It's the war of attrition. But the season's really long, too. So let's talk about this, Rich. We're getting longer periods of infection. I think Carl's right. Having a deeper root system is there. But we'll, that's not going to just completely prevent this. So let's start to take this apart a little bit from a control perspective. Would you recommend, instead of spraying fungicides out of the gate on this, as well as you should, start using ammonium sulfate, acidifying fertilizers in your nutrient program? Is that a good first line of defense? Let's assume you got plants that will grow roots. Um, right. Because... You know, let's assume you don't have plants that that stress that Carl's talking about sets them up for anthracnose. So let's leave that aside. Let's leave that aside. You'll get anthracnose early if you put on too much stress, right? Yes. And we have seen that already. <laughs> you have seen that already. I have okay. anthracnose samples this week already. So, okay. So early season anthracnose is a fascinating phenomenon, right? Yeah, um, it is because of what we've learned about this. Let's I, I'm going to stop here. Let's take go off. Uh, what do you think that's about? Too much stress, too dry. What is going I, on I, this early? Yeah, I think I think there's two things going on. One, I think they had it going into the winter. I'm not a I'm not a proponent of really, really early season new infections. I think the soil temperatures have to be a little higher. That and, and that low temperature threshold for disease activity is not real well uh, uh, defined, but I think it's somewhere in the 55, 65 range, you know. So, so I think this the samples are coming with the anthracnose over the winter, but it's really dry. You know, we we talked about how we're starting to see the dry. We're above average temperature, and it's public golf courses that are getting play all winter. And you know, you got 80 degree days, you got 200 guys out there hitting the balls. And so they have to mow, there's getting traffic and there's a lot of stress already in, in the system, so. Okay, so that's what's a good qualifier, Carl, in our case here, that to really call out moisture stress on healthy plants that didn't start the spring behind the eight ball, like Rick, Rich is talking about here with, with early season anthracnose because of traffic stress, mechanical stress, drought stress, maybe just cold weather and no growth stress, right? I mean, yeah. you're beating these things up, getting them ready, right? They're getting traffic rich, but they're not growing. So well, let's get yeah. it, it, Well, it's 80 degrees one day and it's 55 the next, you know? So, so, you know, we're growing for a couple of days and we're not growing for a week. So, so, you know, but guys are still golfing, right? So, 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 okay. You, when it dried out, wouldn't you have thought last year you would have saw more summer patch? Well, we did. And, and that's an interesting thing because we were wet in the period of time in the spring when the pathogen was starting to grow, right? And, and moisture, you know, I saw the slide from Eric Nelson. Eric always said that water is the on and off switch and temperature is the throttle, right? So if, it's, if we have wet soils, between the 62, the 62 to 80 degree range, 
for soil temperatures, you're going to get more pathogen activity. And then you come to the summer and you dry out and, and you, you're getting that external stress on plants that have a lot of, that are carrying a lot of pathogen, then you're going to get more disease. And last year, summer patch was our number one prop, it, it, you know, oh, okay. as a diagnostic output. Okay. So back, back on the summer patch control train, uh, let's start with ammonium sulfate. Do you like it as an early season fertilizer? Yes. I, I, I just, just be careful not to prep push too much growth, right? You know, cause you're going to get top growth over root growth or, you know, uh, back to the, the, the agronomist side of it, right. but, but, you know, the, the acidifying to the five and a half range and ammonium sulfate seems like one of the best choices for that. Um, is a, is a great tool. It, it you know okay. it, if you're looking at three inch tall Kentucky bluegrass, it's almost all you need to do. You know? Okay. All right. So okay. So now we're coming into the time with soil temperatures based on the model that's in the Rutgers diagnostic uh, the the the, the thing from Kentucky that everybody's contributed to that has efficacy and the different products in it. Uh, we're coming to a two inch depth mid afternoon at least 65 degrees C for five to six, 65 degrees Fahrenheit for five to six days. So we're coming to that window. Rich, that window is what? Peak growth or why? That's, what, go ahead. That's, that's when it's finally warm enough to turn the fungus on and get it to grow, right? Okay. So, so, you know, the, the temperature ranges, you, you know, they do them in a lab, they grow, grow it at all different temperatures, see how fast it grows, yeah. you know, 65 to 82. You're, you're in that window where the throttle is down. Okay. You know? okay. So, so here's what, I, here's my question. Is it, cause I got a lot of notes in the last few days. People like, it looks like it's warming up. Is it summer patch time? I'm, I'm looking at the soils. I'm like, I don't think the soils are going yet for summer patch. Yeah. So is it okay to be early rather than late with timing let's start with timing on these things i i, I think how long is how much protection do you get for how long if you had to guess i i well first of all you're not going to get control of a pathogen unless it's growing and it can it take up the material or interact with the material and that goes back to dr latin you know in his textbooks and stuff so timing matters like there's no reason to put it out you know before the fungus is starting to grow which is why we have the recommendations for the soil temperatures, because we know that's when it's going to start to grow. So proceeding as close as you can to that time period, I think you're going to give it the biggest dose, you know, and have okay. the most effect. Okay. So getting it down and getting it in is going to take a bit of time, right? We talk a lot about the amount of water. We did it with Mike Fidanza last week on the fairy ring conversation. I'm, I'm starting to beat this horse dead now. Uh, that you got to get enough water on it. Are you, the, the fungus only interacts with, with the product when it's starting to infect the root or is the drench designed to really impact the fungus in the soil and all the way through? Ah, that, that is a great question. I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm going to punt that one. And, and I, I think it would have some effect, you know, like a contact, you know, would have some effect. Right. But I think that, you know, uh, you know, and these materials are like fungal growth regulators. So, right. so having a steady source uh, uh, in the plant, you know, will prevent it from invading the plant, right? And so, because uh, we still see the fungus even in, in plants that are healthy that are getting treated. So it's not like it's, it's killing the fungus and eradicating the pathogen, just stops it from growing for a little while, you know? So... Carl's point about the war of attrition is well taken. If it is basically just you use a fungicide, let's say you get it at the right time, you've stunted it. Let's hope roots can keep growing or you got enough because once it's infected early on, it's just going to keep making its way into that root system, right? Deeper and deeper or because at some point, we used to tell people, you don't have to treat anymore. The darn thing's not going to keep growing, right? But now it's like, are you saying guys have to drench every two to three weeks the whole year now because of the way this thing might infect and grow? I think, I think well, one, the fungus doesn't disappear, right? So when the protection wanes, 
then then it's that battle. How much root system do we have? Can we keep the plants alive? And and so so because you know I've seen guys on fungicide programs for 20 years and the superintendent retires, the new guy doesn't know, and it and it and it's a storm of problems until they kind of catch back up, right? And so so uh uh yeah, I, I you have to have regular drenches to keep that fungus, you know, whatever you can do, like soil pH or or manganese, you know, uh, uh, additions to the fertility program or fungicides to keep that fungus from growing any more than it has to, then you can, you can start to win. You know, that's the battle. Keep the roots growing from an ag agronomic standpoint and try to suppress the fungus as much as you can. And if you can get that balance, you get through the season. Okay. So listen, since you brought up the fungicide thing, we're here now. We got about five more minutes. Let's talk a little bit about a problem that seemed to come up in a conversation with our state park golf course superintendents. There's like, Frank, we got to use, you know, you telling us, you know, rotate. You're telling us, uh, you know, use different things. Uh, we're going to have more summer patch problems. Um, I use a lot of combos and rich. You look at this thing, which people can't see or aren't watching us on news channel 10 here. That is a lot of 11 and threes here. There's a yeah. lot of 11 frac codes and 11, a lot of threes. And I bet a lot of guys are not always using it. Is this, am I, should I be worried about this? This seemed like something I wasn't paying attention to until the superintendent asked me. Now yeah. there are singular active ingredients like a firm. Oh, that's for fairy ring. Wait, oh, I didn't, I got the wrong one. Here's the fun. This is the thing off Wisconsin. Yeah. It's the same thing. Uh, I put in summer patch and it gave me sevens and 11s, a, a threes and 11s, almost all threes and 11s yep. on the mode of action rating. How do, what do you tell guys when they use this, is this something we need to be mindful of or just get the darn thing controlled? It's not going to get resistant. Uh, with, with summer patch, we, we've we never had a, a, a situation where we could confirm that there was a resistance problem. Okay. Right. So, so I, I but I will caution you if you're using a lot of uh, DMI materials, that dollar spot is an issue. Right. So, so, so again, I, I think that you can use the, you use the materials. You know, but I would definitely, you know, a couple of DMIs and a couple of strobies, and you're good. We also know that thiophanate methyl is a pretty darn good summer patch control. So that's something right. that you could ro rotate in, even with the restrictions that we see coming down the pike on, on how much you can use. You know, a shot of that is a good dollar spot control too, and that might, you know, help you use a, a little bit less DMI. Okay, there you go. So no confirmed resistance of summer patch organisms to any fungicide program. So that's interesting to hear. Uh, the dollar spot thing is odd because, you know, you put a DMI on and you got to water it in uh, uh, for summer patch, but a dollar spot product you leave on the surface. So if you're using it for summer patch, water it in because that's likely to help a little bit with dollar spot resistance. So you're saying we'll have enough thiophanate methyl, even with the restrictions to get good control. I, I think, I think so. I, I mean, you know, you, how, how many times you're going to use it? Maybe once, maybe twice. Okay. You know? well, and if you, you know, so, and that, that's a, the only other disease where we really like it is gray leaf spot, you yeah. know? And, and, and so, you know, you save it for a gray leaf spot app in the fall and maybe you do one for summer patch in the spring and you're probably still under the, under the, threshold for use okay last thing here is the early season dollar spot we got a buzz about this you brought it up just thank you for doing that the <laughs> dmis we use also create dollar spot issues um i remember this was tested a number of times and it looked like things like ipridione and vinclozolin might have had some benefits those products are not widely used nor available as much as they used to be do you like this as a early season program? Uh, I know you're not a fan of early season stuff. I would imagine this isn't something you necessarily support that it works either moving forward in lowering your dollar spot risk uh, as you get into the season. Right, right. So, so if, you know, if you're going to use a DMI um, for summer patch and you're hitting the 65 soil temperatures, you know, we've had that on our turf grass farm around mid-May, mid 
May 15th. You know, that's about the same time. If, if, if we, if I think back to all my time spent with James Hemfling on the, on the farm, um, he would say 15 8, March or May 15th, May 20th. That's about when dollar spot always starts for us. Right. So, you know, if you have, so your first shot of banner or, you know, probiconazole for summer patch is, is right in line with your dollar spot program. Right. You know, to, to, you, you know, but with dollar spot, just you, there's more pressure to mix it up. Right. And so you're going to come back in a couple of weeks with, with, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, one of the SDHI materials or something. Right. You know? Right. Okay. And, so, okay. and you, you, you know, it'll work. All right, Carl, we weren't lying and we got bonus content at the beginning of this thing. Uh, any burning questions? Otherwise, we'll get Rich out of here. I, I think we nailed it right on the head, Frank. I've got I've got a whole list of notes I just made. People can't see this, but I just make notes. I learned stuff going through this. So I, you know, I got a whole page of notes that I've got now from, right. from your it's conversation. Funny, funny. I, I was writing down notes about irrigation and roots and stuff at the beginning too. <laughs> so even even we learn stuff from this, Frank. It's it's learning opportunity for us all, too. And, and anytime we're talking, I, I'm trying to absorb something. So it's all good. <laughs> hey, Rich. Well, we're Thanks, sorry everyone. we see you at the Cornell show. Carl, get us out of here. Yeah, we, Rich Rich wasn't going to be able to, to shell out the money. They're going for a lot of money. These yeah, tickets, no, Frank. nobody I know has a ticket. Nobody I know has a ticket. So, you know, if, if you want to pay five grand for a dead show, I, I'm going to Los Angeles in the middle of May and, and my tickets cost 150 bucks. So. <laughs> All right. There you go. Economical <laughs> deadheads is, is yeah. how Rich does it. Right. Thanks everyone for joining That's the so Turf, Cornell Turf Show today. We'll be back tomorrow with a, a sports show. Uh, but until then, everybody enjoy the weather. Take Thanks, care. Rich. Thanks, Thanks Rich. Thanks, Carl. Well Thanks, Rich. See you. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.